India is growing and changing fast, but some traditional views are still in place. Institutions like the caste system have been outlawed, yet caste discrimination and segregation still occurs. The most recent economic data indicated in urban areas a wealth gap of 60% exists between people traditionally from the highest and lowest caste. So what is the Indian caste system and how is it affecting modern India? Well, the caste system is a hereditary social hierarchy, also called the Jati system, that's existed in India for nearly 2,000 years. Historians think that these social distinctions may be based in ancient Hinduism, which delineates four major social classes, or Varnas. On top are the Brahmin, usually described as priests and scholars. Then come the Kshatriya, described as nobles and warriors. The Vaisya, below them operate commercial businesses. And then the Sudra, below them are referred to as laborers or servants. Then there is a fifth group completely ostracized from traditional Indian society, the untouchables, now called the Dalits. This is the lowest caste and is relegated to undesirable jobs like cleaning sewers. Because they are considered impure, the Dalits have been regularly segregated from schools and religious temples, and there are reports that some have even been punished for letting their shadow fall on someone of a higher caste. Experts think that this hierarchy wasn't strictly adhered to in the region until the British claimed India as a colony and wrote the caste system into their laws. From there, the system became more rigid, and when India gained independence from Britain in 1947, it was ingrained into the culture. Obviously, the Dalits got the short end of the stick in this historical arrangement. But in 1955, discrimination based on caste was outlawed. And to help reintegrate lower castes into modern society, the government later implemented affirmative action like quotas for certain jobs and university admissions. However, vestiges of the caste hierarchy undoubtedly remain. A politician's caste continues to be an important deciding factor for many voters, and marrying or acting outside of one's caste continues to be taboo in many rural areas. For India to become completely caste-free, more education, government policies, and social programs may be needed. A short video there, of course, on the caste system in India, of course, which I'll talk about today. Uh, of course, Daniel Simon at BRCC. So, hey, anyway, I welcome you back. Of course, uh, another week, of course, of classes at BRCC. Uh, of course, this week I'll be kind of wrapping up uh, discussing ancient India. Uh, we'll talk more about a lot of Indian religions like Hinduism, and I'll also talk about uh, Buddhism and Jainism as well. And then later I show, I'll also kind of spend a little time on uh, various empires, of course, that developed early on in ancient India. So, welcome you back. Of course, uh, looks like I do have some students I know watching live uh, right now. I know Amanda's watching. Good morning. Hey, what's up, Amanda? Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, Marissa, hey, good morning. Uh, also, and then Alex is also joining us. Hey, what's up, Alex? And then also Kelsey as well. So if anybody else is watching, let me know, of course, live, of course, today. So uh, anyway, i uh, kind of talk about a few reminders before I get to my main lecture today, of course, on ancient India. But um, I know we've got a few things out assignment-wise, and I am posting a new assignment today, uh, which, of course, is on ancient India. Uh, but I know we've got that uh, Phoenicians, Israelites uh, quiz still out, uh, which I'll kind of leave that open a few days uh, into this week. But uh, that is coming due soon, so uh, that's something you'll need to kind of wrap up on uh, this week. And then also, uh, I am posting today the uh, Ancient India Quiz, which will be on uh, the lectures on India uh, from this week and, of course, the one uh, today. So uh, there should be an announcement I'll post uh, sometime this morning about that assignment that's coming up for uh, you, of course, to uh, complete in the semester. So I think that's some of our main assignments I know I've got out right now. Uh, but I do have, um, I think so. I think I've got a new vocab assignment I've got out for you uh, if you go to assignments uh, as as well. It uh, looks like also uh, joining us this morning, uh, looks like I've got, I know I've got, I guess I've got Christian, hey, what's going on, coming in uh, as well. Uh, and also Samantha, hey, good morning. It looks like Tristan's also joining us uh, as as well. So yeah, anyway, um, I'm going to, of course, get to, like I said, the main lecture today on that part two, of course, on ancient India, where I'll kind of talk about more about the history of, of India uh, a long time ago. Uh, and um, 
the one the one thing I'm going to talk about first today, I'll get into. I'll kind of discuss the caste system, like what that was. As you saw from that little short video uh, that I just kind of shared with you. Uh, and um, we'll talk about that first about the caste system, and then I'll get into like more into like Hinduism, which I, I didn't quite finish Hinduism from last time. Uh, I didn't really talk about some of the famous gods uh, that are, of course, associated with with Hinduism. Uh, but let me first talk about the caste system, uh, which they were kind of discussing in that short video. Uh, like, again, if you want a definition uh, of the caste system right here, uh, it's called different names. Some people call it the Var Varna system, uh, also Jati, Jati system uh, as well. Uh, but it's mostly a Hindu social class strata or, or structure, uh, which they think developed in, in India a long time ago like in ancient times. I think the theory is, uh, is that it's, they think it was started by the Indo-Aryans when they came into uh, India uh, over 3,000 years ago. A lot of it is based on your lineage, like what, what I guess, birth group you're born into, uh, Jati, I guess they call it too, uh, as well. And uh, of course, we'll get to like the different castes. There's at least four main castes that are, you know, part of uh, the caste system in India. I kind of could share it right here. Uh, you can see, uh, but yeah, it's got different names. Uh, they call it sometimes Varna, uh, which means uh, in Sanskrit, color, because uh, the theory was a long time ago uh, that it was based on people's like skin color, uh, which they think that may have been influenced by. Uh, I think there's a theory that the Aryans were lighter skin, uh, and then the people in India, the indigenous peoples, were darker skin. Uh, and so that kind of led to a different class strata being developed because of that, with the lighter skin people being more on top. Uh, although in India, you know about it, there's different colored skin people, you know, from light skin to darker skin. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the term caste, <clears throat> the, the word caste is more of a, um, I think they believe it originated <clears throat> from the Portuguese, like a long time ago, uh, from the word casta, which casta means uh, <clears throat> lineage, is what they think it means, because uh, of who you're related back to. <clears throat> and I think in Spanish, it's kind of like the same thing, uh, also as well. Uh, then there's a Latin version, castus, uh, which can mean like pure or chaste. Uh, and so it's believed that the ones that are on the highest caste are more pure than the ones on the bottom, that kind of thing. And I think that's something the British noticed when they came into India a long time ago. <clears throat> and then, of course, I was talking about also uh, Jati uh, as well. Uh, jati uh, is like your, your clan or tribe you're born into or even religious community. Uh, and that can be seen sometimes in your surname, uh, basically your family name uh, can kind of stand out. Uh, and so that's why sometimes like people that are Dalits, sometimes there's certain surnames that are linked to that, uh, that kind of sometimes shows that. I'll give you examples of some of these like surnames I'm talking about. Uh, like in India, uh, of course, the most famous one is Gandhi, you know, uh, which supposedly the name Gandhi was kind of linked to people that sold perfume, like in India a long time ago. Doby, washerman, like he washed like dishes or whatever, I guess they're talking about. Uh, Saravastava, I guess you say that, Saravastava, <clears throat> I guess you say that. Uh, military scribe, uh, basically. Uh, so that would be like more of the probably upper class, like, Satria, uh, basically. Uh, and uh, But yeah, those are your four castes that you see right there. The highest caste, of course, is the Brahmins, uh, which those are kind of connected to those that are like priests, academics, uh, would be kind of put into that, scribes, uh, etc. <clears throat> yeah, I think actually that last one would be in Brahmins, actually. Uh, and um, supposedly the belief is that these originate from the gods, like Brahmin's uh, head or, or mouth, I think is what's believed. Uh, and that Satria, <clears throat> they were talking about the Satrias. Uh, those are, like I said, the rulers, uh, the ones that like the kings <clears throat> that, that kind of run run the state. Uh, warriors, like soldiers in the military, would be kind of classified as that. 
Those who come from the gods' arms, basically, his arms. <clears throat> and the Vaishyas, kind of like a middle class, uh, would be like artisans, uh, tradesmen, farmers, uh, and merchants. So they were kind of like your kind of like a middle class, really, in a sense. Uh, shudras would be like on the bottom, the god's feet, like manual labor, servants, and things like that. I guess peasant farmers, uh, that kind of thing, would be in that group. Now, also, uh, you've also got the Dalits, too. Of course, they're talking about that uh, as well. The Dalits, Dalits would be those that are not really in the caste. So they're outside of the caste system. So uh, they're often called outcasts or untouchables uh, in India. Uh, also, they have another name. They're sometimes called uh, Horizons. You may have heard of that term being used, which was supposedly a nickname that uh, Gandhi came up with. Gandhi kind of called them that, uh, which meant uh, supposedly children of God. Uh, but now it's kind of considered like an insult, like an offensive term. Uh, and uh, these are groups that are ostracized uh, from the caste system, which uh, you can see uh, might number uh, over 250 million people uh, in India alone. Uh, it could be also elsewhere, too. These are people that might live uh, where they have Hinduism, you know, throughout the world uh, also. Uh, how do they kind of develop the so-called Dalits or untouchables? Uh, there's different theories that I've read about it. Uh, one is that uh, these were peoples that uh, were like originally indigenous peoples that were in India, and they got kind of put into that group like over time. Uh, another theory I've heard is that these are peoples that are like very poor peoples uh, that do like some of the worst jobs, uh, that kind of thing. And so a lot of it was based off their occupation. Uh, they did uh, like cleaning sewers and just doing unclean things, uh, and that kind of thing, like doing stuff with the dead, uh, et cetera. Uh, also, I had another theory, too, I've read, is that um, it also can be people that uh, left the religion, like that, that were Hindu, uh, and they became like some other religion, uh, like Muslim or Buddhist or whatever, and so they are ostracized uh, because they you're not part of our religion anymore. So that's another theory, I guess, of maybe uh, how they came about. Here's kind of an image of it. So you can see, yeah, a lot of them do a lot of unclean things, cleaning out the sewers, uh, dealing stuff with the dead. Uh, I guess if they have to kill someone or somebody, they would use them instead uh, to do it uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, it's something that they're you know still discriminated against. And uh, untouchability and all that and you know stuff like that is actually banned. And some in I think it, if you go back to like the Constitution of India, 1950. Uh, it's actually been banned, uh, but uh, that in the caste system is still prevalent, you know, throughout India. There's still, of course, a lot of prejudice, of course, uh, throughout India. I think it's worse in the rural areas of India than, say, maybe like in the like in the major cities, uh, that kind of thing. But sometimes it's hard to get a job, like if you're connected to a certain caste, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I want to get into next and talk about more about Hindu religion. Uh, I did want to talk about the different gods uh, that are based in Hindu, which uh, Hinduism has a lot of gods, uh, probably, I think, thousands of them they probably have uh, in, in their religion. Uh, but I did want to talk about the major gods uh, that are important the most. Uh, you can see those. Uh, those are kind of considered the ones that are the most famous gods uh, that they have in Hinduism. Uh, that is the so-called Brahmanistic triad or trinity, uh, which uh, it's got different names. They, they also call it um, Tree Murti is what it's also called, uh, or the three forms, uh, the three forms of Brahman. And uh, you got Brahma, uh, of course, uh, Vishnu and Siva, uh, the ones which are not in order there, of course, in that image. But uh, the one on the far left uh, is, is the god Siva. Uh, the one, the one in the middle, uh, is uh, uh, Vishnu, and the one on the right is Brahma. <clears throat> so those are the different images, of course, of the different gods uh, that you're looking at. They're, they're of course, associated with different attributes, which I'll kind of talk about today uh, uh, overall. Uh, and uh, I'll first go ahead and uh, talk about the fact that a lot of the theology and the gods 
uh, in Hinduism originate from the, the Veda, the Veda, uh, you know, that uh, were brought into India. Uh, so that's where we get a lot of information about, you know, the religion of Hinduism, a lot of the theological ideas, and then the different gods, of course, that appear. Uh, but there's other books, too. Uh, like, I don't know if you know about, uh, they have epics like the Ramayana that's, that's famous in India, uh, which is a famous Sanskritic poem, epic poem about the god Rama, they've heard of. Uh, so you have like a lot of Sanskritic epic poems that are well known uh, as well. Uh, but yeah, the different gods, of course, you're, you're looking at uh, right there, uh, Siva, Vishnu, and Brahma. Yeah, they're called Trimurti. Uh, which means, like, like in Sanskrit, I told you, the three forms, three forms of Brahman, uh, which uh, Siva destroys everything, uh, Vishnu, uh, of course, uh, maintains everything in the universe, then Brahma creates everything in the universe. Uh, so uh, the three forms of so-called Brahman. Let me first talk about Brahma first. So Brahma, there you see there on the right, uh, with his four heads and four arms, is considered like the supreme god, uh, in Hinduism, uh, believed to be the one that created the universe. Uh, and um, supposedly he was the one that gave Hindus uh, like Sanskrit, like the right in the language. And then also the Veda, the Veda uh, scriptures uh, were also given to uh, mankind uh, as well. Uh, and uh, usually you'll see him with like four arms, but the four heads, if you know about that, uh, usually is associated with like the caste system, like each of the different castes uh, that are, are that are in Hinduism, uh, and uh, usually they'll have like, I guess in that image there, he's got the the, the different the four the Vedas that we're talking about, the four Vedas. Uh, of course, he's holding each one of them uh, in his hands. Uh, and a lot of mythology, a lot of these gods will ride around on a certain kind of like a mount, uh, and uh, I believe the the mount's name is Hamsa. Uh, and it's kind of different variations of it, but Hamsa is either a swan or a goose that he'll fly around on, and usually with uh, his consort, uh, which is Saraswati, which I'll, of course, talk about later, but he's one of, like, three of those main uh, Brahmanistic triad. Of course, that's very famous in Hinduism. Uh, by the way, Brahma's not as popular uh, compared to like Vishnu and Siva. Those are the two most popular denominations where Hindus practice worshiping those gods. A lot of times they worship more than one, well, if you know about that. Uh, but um, it's not as popular compared to ancient times. If you go to India, uh, there are not that many temples that have been built to Brahma uh, that are around compared to, say, Vishnu or Siva. But I think Vishnu is the most popular god overall. Uh, then there's Vishnu, you see there in the image. Uh, Vishnu is seen as the preserver. So Brahma's the creator, Vishnu's the preserver. Uh, he's also sometimes called the maintainer. So he helps maintain and preserve the universe, and keep it like stable. Uh, and um, like it says, he's considered one of the greatest gods uh, in Hinduism. Uh, they usually call it... Um, Vishnuism, I guess, is the denomination uh, they call it uh, in Hinduism. Uh, and um, got one head, of course, and four arms that you're looking at. But he's a very popular god. Uh, I think I want to say the denominations that practice it is like close to two-thirds or more. I prefer this god uh, over some of the other ones. And... Um, more popular in northern India. I think I think Vishnu is more popular in the north, and I thought Siva is more popular in the south, southern part of India, or something like that. But um, yeah, he flies around on a vehicle too, or mount, uh, which is Garuda. I believe Garuda is like a type of falcon god uh, in Hindu mythology, uh, and he has also a consort too uh, that's famous, which is Lakshmi, Lakshmi uh, as well. Now, part of why Vishnu uh, is popular uh, is because there's different incarnations. Suppose there's like 24 of them or something like that where Vishnu came down to earth uh, in human form. Uh, and um, they, call him a, they call it an avatar or also called a, uh, I think it's also called a, of course, an incarnation. And uh, there's different ones you see there. Uh, Krishna, 
of course, is one that's popular, but the most uh, famous incarnation of Vishnu is Rama, uh, which supposedly Rama is the, um, I think it's the seventh seventh um, incarnation of Vishnu. And uh, that's part of why Vishnu is so popular, because there's different variations of him that are, of course, you know, well, well known. <clears throat> Uh, then, of course, we got uh, Siva, or also pronounced Shiva, of course, the destroyer god uh, in Hinduism. Uh, this is the Hindu god associated with, like, death and reincarnation. Uh, so I guess he's involved uh, in the cycle of where your soul ends up uh, after you die. Like, after your, your body dies and you become something else, uh, Shiva's involved in, I guess, reincarnating you uh, and all that. And so he's a very popular god, too. I think that's the second most popular god uh, behind Vishnu, of course, uh, in, in Hinduism. Uh, and um, he also has a vehicle, too. Uh, it's the, the bull god Nandi. Uh, you may have seen before. I think it's a white bull. Uh, and uh, Nandi uh, and uh, his wife, well, consorts, different variations, Shakti or Parvati or something like that. Uh, it's usually his main consort. Of course, that's famous. Uh, it says there, supposedly his hair is the flowing Ganga or Ganges River. river. So uh, that's part of why the Ganges River is considered sacred uh, to some Hindus. Now, I think he's more popular in the southern part of India because I was talking about that temple uh, that's behind me uh, that's famous, uh, which is a temple to S Siva uh, back there, which is in, I think, close to the tip of India right there. So, yeah, those are like the chief gods, you know, associated with, you know, uh, Hindus, like the three the three supreme male gods uh, that are most famous. Uh, let me talk about also the uh, different supreme goddesses. Uh, those basically are um, these right here, Saraswati, Lakshmi, Shakti, although Shakti's got variations, Kali or Parvati uh, also uh, as well. Uh, they do have a name for uh, the Hindu supreme goddesses. Uh, they're sometimes called Tridevi, uh, which means the three goddesses, three goddesses of Brahman. And they represent different attributes, which I'll kind of talk about. The, I think the one that's the most popular is Shakti, you know, Shaktiism, which is a denomination in Hinduism. Uh, and um, Saraswati, you see there, is the consort of Lord Brahma. Of course, uh, she, of course, associates things like mostly knowledge, uh, but uh, anything to do with knowledge, wisdom, learning, uh, the arts, science, music, uh, things like that right there. A lot of times you'll see her with different things in her hands. Uh, like it's kind of like it's like a sitar, but it's called a vena, which is like a type of string instrument that she'll see she'll a lot of times see her carrying uh, a rosary. Uh, which I guess is in Hinduism, and then also I think the other thing she's holding in her one of her left hands is the uh, one of the I guess Vedas, uh, yeah, the Vedas of course right there, uh, also. I also notice like the swastika being used with her and other Hindus uh, also as well. That's something you see. It's quite famous uh, in Hinduism. It's used in Buddhism. It's used in Jainism uh, as well. And uh, the swastika is like a um, kind of a Eurasian Eastern symbol uh, that's been around for thousands of years. Uh, it's actually usually connected with good things like luck, fortune, prosperity, and wealth. Uh, and uh, in a lot of images, uh, it's not usually like the Nazi version, which you see on the left and also the one on the right. It tends to be more square, uh, you see. Uh, either facing left or facing right. A lot of times they'll have dots in it uh, also as well. Although it's kind of theorized about how the Nazi version came about, but I think there was a theory I've heard that Hitler saw it in a, some kind of church, like in Germany, uh, in it may have gone back to dramatic times. But uh, they say that um, swastikas have been around going back to Greco-Roman times and Viking times, uh, so it's kind of a symbol that was used in Europe as well, and not just in Asia. Uh, the Germans call it the Hockenkreuz, is what they call it, hook cross, uh, which is what they call the swastika. Uh, other gods, of course, you see it. Lakshmi, of course, another famous uh, goddess uh, in Hinduism. 
Uh, she's often associated with things like wealth, prosperity, fortune, luck. Uh, and uh, she's often symbolized having four arms uh, as well, which you often see her holding like a lotus plant or uh, sitting on a lotus plant, which I think that's also connected to uh, the Ganges River as well. And uh, also elephants. Uh, you have also uh, the god Ganesh or Ganesha. Uh, is a very famous male god in Hinduism. That's her brother. Uh, and she, he's often connected with things like fortune, uh, luck, uh, also elephants, which elephants were kind of considered sacred animals uh, in India. Uh, they're also used as pachyderms to move things around and also used in warfare uh, as well, kind of like ancient battle tanks. Uh, and, uh, and I think he also was a patron of the arts. Uh, and, and like Ganesha was connected with things like wisdom, math, science, and stuff like that, of course, as well. So she's also popular, Lakshmi, of course, as a supreme goddess. Uh, then, of course, Shakti, which there's, like I said, versions of her, uh, which she's got all kinds of things she's connected to, cosmic energy, death, destruction, time, and change. Uh, she's, you know, associated with reincarnation uh, like Lord Siva is, uh, you know, basically her husband. Uh, and um, there's variations of her uh, that are popular, like Parvati, I think, is very popular. Uh, and also the god goddess Kali as well, which are kind of similar uh, to each other. But Shakti is really the most popular supreme goddess in Hinduism. Uh, in fact, they have a denomination. They often call it Shaktiism uh, that I've talked about. So those are the different, you know, goddesses that are popular. There's, of course, other gods, too, that they have in Hinduism. But I think those are considered the most popular ones overall uh, that I usually talk about the most. So uh, anyway, uh, let me go ahead. I want to move on to uh, to talk about next the rise of Buddhism as well, which, you know, Buddhism is something that becomes popular in India and ends up spreading throughout different parts of Asia. Uh, and you um, can see there, uh, Buddha, uh, if you know about him, he was the figure that really started this uh, new religion throughout the world. Uh, he lived about 500 B.C., uh, and uh, Buddha's real name was Siddhartha Gautama. That's what he was actually called. And uh, it's believed that he was an Indian prince of some type who came from that probably uh, Kshatriya um, caste uh, that we talked about. He was either from that or maybe even Nepal, I think is one theory where he may have lived. And uh, his father was a king of a uh, Indian republic. Uh, and if you know the story about Buddha, he decided to live, uh, actually left his lifestyle of, of, of you know, being a uh, royalty. And he became this traveling monk uh, and, and uh, teacher throughout India. Uh, and so he, he basically started Buddhism about maybe 2,500 years ago. At least that's the theory about uh, when when he lived, they think he taught Buddhism throughout maybe where the Indo-Gangetic plain uh, is throughout India. But you can see kind of a definition of it. Uh, it's an Indian religion that broke away uh, from Hinduism, uh, which was based on the teachings of Buddha. Uh, and uh, it does talk about like what the Buddhist like main aim was or main goal uh, that they were trying to do. Uh, the Buddhists were one of the first to try to challenge uh, the traditional teachings of Hinduism. Uh, they believed that there had to be some kind of way that you could liberate your soul from the cycle of reincarnation or samsara and do it within one lifetime. And so supposedly that was something that Buddha figured out uh, during his life. So, yeah, Buddha was supposedly in his 30s uh, when uh, he decided to basically leave uh, his lifestyle uh, as a prince uh, and become this like monk. Uh, and uh, he tried different methods to reach uh, what he called enlightenment. Uh, I know one where it was he tried to, like I think there's an image right there where he's sitting under a tree. We see that image right there. He sat under a tree and tried to like starve himself to death, like eating like, extreme asceticism, I think they called it. And so that method didn't work. Uh, and but he figured out 
the best way to live your life uh, was to live what he called a middle path or middle way, uh, which is kind of this path between two extremes uh, where you're not like practicing like extreme uh, asceticism or uh, extreme uh, sensual indulgence would be the other way uh, as well. But to live your life, uh, basically this mean or middle way of living, uh, which we ba based on like certain dharmas uh, that he would create. I think he called the eight dharmas, so-called dharma wheel, of course, that represents it in, in um, Buddhism. Uh, he would eventually teach what they call the Four Noble Truths, uh, which uh, later, of course, Buddha uh, is called the Enlightened One. Uh, they called him this because, by the way, I think he was like, I want to say 35, or was in his 30s, I know, when he reached enlightenment. Uh, so they called him the Enlightened One, the Buddha. Uh, and um, his main teachings were eventually called the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and uh, the Four Noble Truths, uh, were these four main ideas about like what was basically what it is? It's what was you know causing reincarnation and how to end it. That's pretty much in a nutshell of what the four noble truths uh, were really about. I'll kind of I'll kind of go through and discuss like the different uh, four noble truths and what they are, but they're, they're very important. They're like the central teachings of Buddhism, of what Buddha taught. You know. I guess 2,500 years ago, they basically tell you like what causes reincarnation and how to end it, how to end, I guess, samsara or the cycle of reincarnation, et cetera. Uh, of course, you see there, I've got the Sanskritic names, they call it. Uh, the first one is uh, dukkha. That's the first noble truth, uh, which means in Sanskrit, suffering. And so what Buddha believed was that Everybody was uh, basically, their souls were suffering because they're constantly being reincarnated like over hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, so that's going on. So samsara is basically uh, what's, called, what's, what's that with the suffering. Uh, the second noble truth is called samudaya, uh, which uh, there's different translations of that, but I guess it can mean like the cause, the cause of the suffering. And uh, what Buddha said was that the cause of the suffering is because humans throughout their life, maybe even, I guess, animals or whatever, are constantly trying to get material things, like physical things, uh, power, money, food, or uh, whatever. Their whole life is about that, basically. Uh, and so uh, he says that's the reason why everybody's reincarnating because they're constantly trying to get all these things that they, I guess, need to live or whatever. And their whole life is about it, obsessing over it and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's the so-called second noble truth. The third noble truth is Naroda, uh, which there's different translations of what it may mean. A cessation, I think, is one variation, uh, or maybe the word is ending uh, in Sanskrit as well. That's where you renounce all the attachment to all these material things, desires, and so on. And your whole life isn't about that, obsessing over that, uh, in that kind of thing. Uh, and the last one is Maga, or sometimes Marga, also as well, uh, the so-called fourth noble truth, last one. Uh, and uh, in Sanskrit, uh, Maga or Marga means path, is what it means, translation. And they sometimes call that the so-called middle path, middle way, central path or central way. It's got all kinds of different names uh, that they call it. Uh, and um, that one includes various dharma that you have to follow, which I do have it right here for you. But there's basically called also the noble eightfold path is the other name they call it. It's got all kinds of names. Uh, they dub it. But you have to have all these right things that you have to do, uh, which right view. Uh, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Uh, and it's usually symbolized, if you know about this, in the so-called Dharma wheel or Dharma chakra, if you want the uh, Sanskrit uh, wheel of Dharma. Uh, and uh, those are all the eight that you have to follow, the eight Dharma to live your life, you know, this middle path 
uh, that Buddha is talking about. So right view, uh, you have to know the truth. Uh, right intentions, you have to free your mind of evil things. You can't think about evil things or bad things or even doing bad things. Right speech, say nothing that hurts other people. Uh, right actions, work for the good of others. Uh, right livelihood, respect of life. Uh, no killing things. Buddhists are nonviolent. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, they're pacifists. Uh, right effort, resist evil. Uh, right concentration, practice meditation, prayer, things like that. Right mindfulness, controlling your thoughts, uh, things like that. Uh, so all, all those are different, you know, dharma that you have to follow throughout your life uh, if you want to reach enlightenment and, of course, in, in reincarnation. Uh, in the end. So, uh, and about Buddhism, by the way, it did spread. Uh, if you look here, uh, of course, it, they, they think it spread, uh, or at least it started, they think, in that northern part of India and maybe Nepal. And then you can see it went up into Tibet and China, uh, Mongolia, uh, into China itself, uh, Southeast Asia, from like Burma, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam. Korea, Japan, Taiwan, uh, all those are areas that uh, Buddhism uh, basically spread to. And you end up with like three different types of Buddhism. They have Vajrayana Buddhism, of course, uh, which is one that you see, it's mostly the one that Tibetan Buddhism that's well known, associated with like the Dalai Lama, of course, uh, Mahayana Buddhism, and then Theravada Buddhism is also popular like in Southeast Asia, as well. But Mahayana Buddhism is more popular. You see East Asia, like in China, Korea, uh, and of course, uh, Japan. Uh, if you know about Buddhism, uh, it's the fourth largest religion in the world. So it's kind of like behind Christianity, uh, Islam, uh, and Hinduism. I think the number of people that practice is like over 500 million people uh, throughout the world, with China having the most uh, Hindu, uh, the most Buddhists uh, overall, which I think it's something like 250 million maybe range uh, is, is what it is. Uh, however, if you know about China, it's, they're mostly atheists uh, because of communism. Uh, but they have other things like they've got also not just Buddhism, but they've got uh, Confucianism, probably uh, Taoism, uh, and then maybe some Christians here and there uh, as well. Uh, here's another map showing you on the left kind of where it starts. So you can see the central part of it was in that north, northern or eastern part of India uh, and also Tibet, not Tibet, Nepal. Yeah, northern India and Nepal mostly. Then you can see it went south. You can see down to where Sri Lanka is. Where Sri Lanka is mostly uh, Buddhist. Uh, it also went up into Afghanistan, uh, which they think the Greeks helped spread Buddhism kind of to the west. Uh, also, uh, you can see it going up in Tibet, Mongolia, China, and working its way down uh, into uh, Southeast Asia. But don't forget, it's also down into like, like around Sumatra and Indonesia, uh, Philippines, uh, and so on, all those areas, Borneo. And then, of course, you can see Japan, Taiwan, et cetera, Korea also. So those are all the areas, I guess, where it's most dominant. Uh, Buddhism, but uh, I also see Buddhism in the Pacific. Like you go to Hawaii, in the United States, Hawaii, uh, you'll have a lot of Buddhist temples uh, that are also there. Uh, so I've been to Hawaii a few times. Now, also, I, oh, uh, I, I also wanted to talk about Jainism uh, as well, I'll kind of get into that, because that's kind of another offshoot religion that kind of broke away. Uh, from from um, Hinduism as well, uh, which uh, it's got different names. They usually call it uh, Jan Dharma is what they call it. Uh, and it's a type of Indian religion that uh, started around the same time as Buddhism. So about 6th or 5th century, I think, is when they think it started uh, in India a long time ago. And it was founded by that man on the right you see in that image named Mahavara, who's also known as Vardhaman. Uh, as well. And um, they think he was some kind of uh, Hindu uh, prince like um, 
probably like um, Indian prince like uh, Buddha was a long time ago. And he, he did the same thing. He challenged Hinduism as well. Uh, he had his own ideas about how they could, you know, end uh, reincarnation, but his was different compared to uh, Buddhism. Like, how does it how does it differ uh, from Buddhism? Well, uh, if you know about them, uh, they tended to prefer to use more extreme asceticism, like in living their lifestyle. Uh, instead of that middle path of living, uh, we were talking about uh, where it's between you know two extremes. Uh, they went more to extreme asceticism. Uh, like, you know, extreme fasting and stuff like that would be an example of that, or you would get rid of all your material things, like you wouldn't own a whole lot of uh, wealth, uh, you wouldn't wear a lot of clothes, you'd kind of live the lifestyle of a monk, even if you're like a lay person. Uh, and so the word Jan supposedly meant in Sanskrit to conquer, to conquer your desires, your material things. Uh, and so that's primarily what what they tried to do with this particular movement, but it's not as popular, you know, compared to say Hinduism or even Buddhism. Uh, you can see around five million people or more practice it uh, throughout the world. Uh, predominantly, it's mostly practiced in India. Uh, I think the western part of India is mostly where it's more popular. Uh, but it has spread throughout the world. I mean, you have people that are Jans uh, that are in like Canada, uh, the United States, uh, Europe. And they think in the last so many years, uh, they've had Jans that have spread also into Japan also. Uh, so it's not a movement that's real popular, like I said, uh, compared to Buddhists uh, or Hindus. Uh, so it's kind of this minority uh, religion. So um, that's that's enough about religion, of course, uh, with ancient India and, of course, India today uh, in parts of the world. Uh, I want to talk about next for a few minutes about different. Uh, oh, and here I'll kind of show you this real quick here before I move on. I've got another slide showing you that some of the beliefs uh, that they're big into. Ahimsa is a belief that uh, is big in also Buddhism, uh, which is this idea of being nonviolent. So. Uh, that basically, no physical violence, uh, things like that. Uh, so they, they, you know, they all want to, you know, not harm, uh, you know, living things and stuff like that. And so a lot of Jans tend to be like vegetarians. Uh, but in a lot of cases, they even would sit there and do extreme fasting or starve themselves to death. And I think in India, they talked about some of these Jan kings that did that, where they starved themselves to death. You know, as an example, karma. Yeah, because they believe that for every action there is a consequence. They say, like, they believe this in pretty much Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, reincarnation. Yeah, they believe in that too. But they're trying to kind of stop it uh, with with their uh, idea of extreme asceticism. They think that might be a key uh, to ending it uh, compared to Buddha's, uh, you know, middle path. So those are some other things they do, non-violence, truthfulness, non-stealing, celibacy. It's another thing that's part of, too, of Jainism, non-possession, not owning a whole lot of things as well. Now, I want to talk about, uh, of course, the rise of Indian empires, which are, you know, become famous uh, in India a long time ago. Of course, there's one, one famous uh, empire that's well known uh, is the Maurya Empire, which developed more than, I think more than 2,000 years ago is when it existed in, in ancient India. Uh, that, that image there you can see in the middle is the, the king Ashoka, Ashoka the Great. Uh, by the way, one of the greatest kings uh, in ancient India. Uh, that's his symbol on the left uh, with, the, with the three lions uh, on it. And it's got that Ashoka wheel uh, that's famous, which I think is often seen in the Indian flag uh, today. Uh, and uh, they call it different names. Of course, Maria Empire. You'll see also Marian, M Marian as well, which is the name of the dynasty uh, that, of course, will rule rule India overall. And uh, the Marian Empire uh, was this uh, pan uh, Indian empire that 
was one of the first to take the whole subcontinent and unify it as one empire. So they were the first to do this uh, in ancient times. And you can see the empire lasted from about 322 uh, to, 100, to 185 BC. Uh, so it lasted roughly 100 something years, well, probably one and a half centuries, I think is about how long uh, it was a, it was around. Uh, and um, there, of course, is kind of a map of the actual empire uh, when it peaked in the third century BC. So you can see this empire controlled land from what they think was Afghanistan into Pakistan and controlled most of India, except for the bottom of it in Sri Lanka. And then I think part of Bangladesh uh, was also part of it uh, as well. So it was a massive empire. Uh, and um, of course, that was one of the first rulers that really came to power, which is Chandragupta Maurya. He was considered really uh, the founder of the dynasty and the first emperor uh, that ruled uh, over over India at the time. Uh, and I don't know if you know much about the Indian monarchs. Uh, a lot of times they're called a uh, Maharaja, uh, which uh, there's different translations of that uh, in Sanskrit, but it often means either it says great king or high king, uh, which is kind of like equivalent to like, almost like an emperor would be, I guess what it would be uh, maybe to the West. They have a Persian version, which is also, you can see, Shah and Shah, like the Persian empires used uh, Shahs, uh, which were the king of kings. And if you know about it, it's kind of like an inflated title. It's like, I'm not a king, I'm a great king, uh, is basically what it is. Although you can say I'm a great king of kings. <laughs> it's kind of getting more inflated. But they did this in Iraq, too. Like a lot of the Syrian kings, like Ashurbanipal, would say that, I'm the king of kings and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, they do think that this actual uh, state uh, developed in an area called Magadha, which is kind of like in the eastern part of India. And they conquered the state called the Nanda Empire that was there in northern India. They, they took over that. They formed an empire out of it. And then what happened was they think that Alexander the Great's empire, uh, which had conquered part of India, it collapsed. And they took part of that, too, like Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, which... Uh, he actually took over uh, Alexander the Great uh, in the fourth century. So I think Alexander did this right before Chandragupta Maurya came in. Uh, and so I'm guessing that uh, Alexander, what he did in the West was kind of an influence, uh, you know, on these Indian empires that would be founded later. Now, I think vice versa, they were kind of influenced by him, too, also as well. Uh, there's Chandragupta right there. You can see he reigned from 328 to 298 BC. So he was around for about 30 something years as a ruler. Uh, they do think he uh, developed a huge standing army and he was able to use that to conquer most of northern India, pushing into at one point close to Pakistan and Afghanistan. So all that area under him uh, was, was consolidated into one massive state uh, at that time. Uh, he had a capital, which you see right there, Pataliputra, you may have heard of it. Uh, it was, of course, a famous city, uh, which is located on the Ganges or Ganga River. Uh, it's, if you know about the a lot of empires in, in India, a lot of them are based around the Ganges River in northern eastern India. Uh, and uh, it's located near uh, the modern city of Patna, which is kind of uh, kind of just west of Bangladesh. Uh, and so that became the central capital of that empire and other empires that followed. I think the Gupta Empire, that was pretty much its capital uh, that they would have. And they think it dates back to about 500 B.C. That's that's when the actual city uh, was founded. Here's kind of some images of it with these, some of the ruins uh, that you're looking at right there. So about 500 B.C. Uh, is when they think the city was founded uh, There's kind of debate about how big it was. But they think under the Mauryan Empire, it may have gotten to about 400,000 people uh, in size. So they do think it may have been one of the largest cities uh, in the world, kind of like Babylon was. Uh, we had talked about before Nineveh as large cities. And it was huge in size. I think what I researched, it was about 15 square miles uh, in size, the actual city, or if you want kilometers 
uh, 25 square kilometers. Uh, and uh, Greek, the Greeks actually wrote about it. The Greek historian Arian uh, said that it had something like 64 gates uh, to the city with 570 towers. So it must have had huge fortifications that were around it uh, at Palaputra. But now, of course, you can see it's mostly uh, in ruins today. Uh, here's kind of a stupa, uh, which is located, I think, at the same site uh, where the ruins of, of Padalaputra, which a stupa is like a, a kind of like a shrine uh, where they keep like the bones of Buddhist monks in it. Uh, and you can go in there and meditate, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and so that was kind of constructed there. I think Ashoka the Great built that later though at that site. Uh, now, they have another king that came in after uh, Chandragupta Maurya died. Uh, that was, of course, uh, Bindusara, uh, who was believed to be uh, his son. Uh, he reigned, uh, you can see, from about 297 to 273 B.C. Uh, they think under Bindusara uh, that they pretty much began to consolidate uh, Chandragupta's empire. And Bindusara also began expanding the empire to the south like into the southern part of the subcontinent of India, but not too much is known about him. Uh, there's a lack of historical sources about Bindusara because uh, most, I think most sources talk about either Chandragupta, Maurya, or Ashoka the Great, who's, of course, the most famous overall. That's the one I really want to talk about the most, uh, of course, which is Ashoka the Great. You see the third, third ruler, of course, and the greatest, of course, of the Mauryan uh, Empire. Uh, he ruled, of course, uh, following his father dying, Bindusara. Uh, he reigned from 268 to about 232 BC. Uh, and uh, they think under him, he kept expanding the empire, which they think he kind of expanded to the east and south uh, to where the Bay of Bengal is uh, at one point. And... Um, one thing he did that's very famous, he conquered this area called Kalinga, uh, just kind of a famous kingdom and people of India uh, that are kind of around where the Bay of Bengal is, uh, to a little bit to the west and south of uh, where Bangladesh is now. And uh, he was involved in a series of bloody wars uh, that they call the Kalinga Wars, uh, which were fought uh, throughout his empire. Uh, and... Um, some estimates he may have killed in that war, like 200,000 people or more uh, in the conquest of that area. It was kind of considered like one of the last conquests of the whole uh, Mauryan Empire. Uh, so, uh, so that's something that he's kind of famous for uh, with that. And so under his reign, you know, by that time, you know, the empire starts to get bigger and bigger. Now, you can see here in this map here, I think after that conquest, that's kind of what his empire looked at like afterwards. Now, the only thing was apparently, I think that what I've read about, about Shaka was that that war influenced him uh, religious wise. Uh, one thing that happened that's well known, uh, he converted to Buddhism. That's something that's very famous. Uh, and so he's considered like one of the first major Buddhist uh, rulers of India. Uh, he not only made it popular in India, parts of India, uh, but he also helped to spread it. So he sent like Buddhist monks, missionaries uh, into different parts of Asia, uh, mostly probably northward, like I guess towards Afghanistan and then uh, like into Tibet and Central Asia uh, as well. And uh, that included not just that, but he also constructed like different types of Buddhist temples uh, throughout India. Uh, told you he built shrines, uh, he built stupas uh, throughout India. Uh, and so uh, Shaka, Shaka was well known for being a patron uh, in support of those that were, of course, uh, Buddhist. I think I've got some other images right here. He's also known for uh, these things called the edicts of Ashaka, uh, which uh, were uh, put on pillars, called also the so-called Shaka pillars, which you see in one of them right there, uh, that picture uh, Shaka pillar, and I guess the one on the right uh, as well. Some of the pillars will have like, I think like three, I guess it's like three lions on it, uh, basically. And uh, they found at least 33 inscriptions or edicts that were published like during his reign. Uh, and 
a lot of the edicts uh, reference Buddhism because you know, he had such big support for it. And, and so that was something that was a big thing he wanted to do uh, as a ruler of India. But a lot of his ideas uh, talk about laws, which uh, are uh, universal law. You know, the idea of everybody having the same kind of equal law uh, in, in, in India, uh, the idea of social order, uh, the idea of piety, uh, in also the order of also the belief in righteousness. Those are ideas that he kind of pushed uh, in a lot of a lot of his laws overall. I think that's kind of you're looking at some of the ruins there of the capital, Pat, Pataliputra, of course, near uh, Patna uh, in India. So yeah, he's really considered their greatest ruler. Uh, you know, today uh, in the Indian flag, uh, they have the famous Ashoka wheel. Uh, which is now in it, which is really a Buddha symbol, but uh, it's basically there uh, from from that time period a long time ago. All right, I want to talk about also for a few minutes the Gupta Empire. That was another famous empire uh, that developed in India, which was much later. Uh, in fact, it was more into like the end of uh, late late antiquity or late ancient times uh, in India. Uh, what happened was uh, there were a few more rulers that reigned after Ashoka died. I think I want to say six more that reigned later. Uh, but the empire broke up, and India broke up into, like, multiple competing kingdoms. Uh, and it wouldn't be until the Gupta Empire came about uh, that they reunited it uh, as, as one empire. Uh, kind of what was the Gupta Empire? It was this India state, Indian state that was... Uh, located around where Magadha is, uh, we're talking about India, but it was based again uh, in the Ganges River Valley. And you can see that was the time period, fourth to the sixth century CE. Uh, so like 300s to about the 500s uh, AD or CE uh, that you're looking at. And it's a very famous period. Uh, kind of should kind of blow it up right here. You can see Paloputra was one of its major cities, of course, capitals. Uh, that was part of this uh, empire. Uh, they do call that period the Golden Age of India. They dub it that because that was considered the peak period of where Indian culture in ancient times peaked, like culture, art, uh, literature, science, math, medicine. Uh, so uh, the Guptas were, in, were ingenious with a lot of things, like in medicine, uh, if you know about it, they were the first to develop vaccines, like a long time ago. Uh, math, I think they, they developed the idea of the, the zero, something they kind of developed. Uh, I know, in, I know in, um, with astronomy, they were able to figure out uh, that the Earth uh, has 365 and one-fourth of a day. They developed like one of the first solar calendars that's actually accurate, uh, things like that. A lot of literature, uh, a lot of art and sculpture uh, also, of course, being developed. Uh, in ancient India. Uh, they did have different rulers that reigned over it. Here's another image, of course, of the Gupta Empire. But uh, the one they talk about that was the first one that founded it was a uh, ruler named Sir Gupta, uh, who was an Indian king that they think lived maybe close to about uh, the late third century. And so that's where the name comes from. In fact, the Gupta name is a very famous surname uh, in India, like modern India today, a lot of people have that name. Uh, so it's kind of sent it back to these people. Uh, and uh, one thing about the Gupta dynasty, uh, it was a Hindu dynasty. They helped to popularize it throughout India, but uh, they let other religions practice like Jainism and Buddhism as well. Uh, you can see those are some other famous rulers. Uh, they have also the ones that were big, they talk about usually are Chandra Gupta the first, uh, Samudra Gupta, and also Chandra Gupta the second. Those would be the probably the most famous ones uh, that are well known. I think out of the emperors, uh, the one that's the big one was Chandra Gupta the first, uh, who lived in the fourth century. Uh, he was known for reuniting the Indian subcontinent in like into an empire. And so he's the one that really, really starts the actual empire itself, because they think it started out as a kingdom back in the 200s CE. And then uh, Chandra Gupta I was the grandson of the original king Gupta. 
Uh, they're known for other things, like one thing I did want to mention about, which is real famous. Uh, they're famous for starting one of the first universities, like in the world, uh, which was called Nalanda. You may have heard of it. Uh, Nalanda was believed to be some type of Buddhist monastic university, which was situated now today in what would be Bihar, India, which I think is in the eastern eastern part of India. And uh, they think it was developed in the 400s <clears throat> CE or 5th century CE. Uh, and um, <clears throat> it was kind of famous for developing a lot of not just cultural ideas uh, that were you know, based off Buddhism on uh, things like that, but a lot of uh, sacred uh, Sanskritic texts were written there uh, over time. <clears throat> In fact, I think they said at one point that uh, their libraries had over 9 million texts of various philosophies uh, that probably not just Buddhism, but Hinduism and other things in culture, math, science, uh, any kind of ideas uh, that were circulating in India, it was kind of uh, there uh, at that university. Now, is it the first university in the world? Not, They're not sure about that. Uh, I think the theory I have uh, about universities, <clears throat> I guess if you had to have one that was like the first university, uh, it would really be uh, likely Plato's the Academy. Uh, which I think goes back to something like 4th century B.C., so a little, little further back uh, than that. Uh, but <clears throat> for, you can see it was around a long time, like seven, 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 eight centuries uh, that existed at one point. But uh, if you know what happened, it got sacked by uh, Muslim invaders, uh, and they destroyed it. And a lot of the texts got burned, uh, if, you know, if you know about that issue. Uh, what happened to the Gupta Empire? Uh, well, if you know about the Gupta Empire, uh, they got sacked by these people called the Huns, which are called either the Huna peoples or the White Huns. I think they're called different names. Uh, they usually nickname them. Uh, and uh, they sacked the state in the 6th century CE. So 500s uh, CE uh, was, was when that occurred. And so their empire collapsed and broke up. And so for a long time, uh, India doesn't really have any major empires. I think you've got a collection of kingdoms <clears throat> that are throughout, like India. I don't think you really get, I think the next <clears throat> major um, kingdoms that you, at least that the states that become empires is the Mughal Empire. Uh, you get that empire, which is a Muslim empire uh, that will develop close to like the 1500s uh, in India. And you also got the Maratha Empire. And if you're that one, there's another empire uh, that also developed right after that one. Uh, before the British come in, the British take over India, uh, like kind of like between the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, you get the British come in. And the British control India for like 300 years or more. Uh, so called British Raj, uh, they're in power. Uh, and so India, for a long time, like in modern times, uh, is controlled by foreign, foreign powers. So, so anyway, that's that's kind of the, the, the history of, you know, the background of ancient India uh, with that. Uh, I did want to, of course, announce today, of course, I want to talk about quizzes that are out there. Of course, you've got that particular quiz, uh, which is still out. Of course, the one on the Phoenicians uh, and the Israelites. Uh, so don't forget that. I think it's due later uh, this week. And then, of course, you've got the main quiz, uh, of course, I'm posting today. Uh, on the ancient India lectures. Uh, that'll be due later uh, in, in March. So I, I'm, of course, I should have an announcement about that uh, in Canvas today. Uh, you know, know about that and start taking that uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so, yeah, I know next week, uh, this week and next week, I'll be kind of moving on to talk about ancient, I'll talk about ancient China. And so we are, of course, our next topic. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how China develops uh, in East Asia around the Yellow River Valley. Uh, we'll talk about the different dynasties and empires uh, that were famous in China. Definitely talk about the Great Wall. Uh, we'll talk about Confucianism. Uh, those are kind of famous things that are, of course, well known uh, in, in ancient ancient India. Uh, looks like I did have a few students that came in late. I know Becky came in. Hey, what's up, Becky? Uh, also, Kayla also came in. I know uh, a little later, and of course, also, sorry about that, Jim, Jeremiah also joined us uh, as well. So don't forget, if you have any comments, questions, of course, about this lecture, do let me know, of course. 
either on my channel uh, or, of course, uh, you can also leave comments, uh, questions in Canvas discussions for students uh, as as well. So it looks like I don't have any other comments, questions historically, uh, but uh, that'll be it, of course, for today. Uh, but like I said, later in the week, I'll, of course, be moving on uh, to talk about ancient China. So y'all have a great you know, rest of the week uh, coming up, uh, of course, at BRCC. So y'all take care.